So this has been a bit of a rough decade for Sonic the Hedgehog. We've had Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, the Archie series was cancelled, and the fan base was more divided than I think it ever has been. That's not to say nothing good happened. I mean, we did get Sonic Mania this decade, and we even got Sonic Forces, which was a step in the right direction for the series. And that Sonic Boom TV show was certainly well received by fans and critics. So, it's not all been bad, but a lot of bad things have happened this decade. And a lot of blame has been pushed towards Sega, Iazuka, and Penders, but I don't think putting the blame on them single handedly would be necessarily the wisest idea. Especially since two of these parties have had very little negative impact. All Ken Penders did was just cause his characters to not appear, and the fact that we'll never get a Sonic Chronicles sequel really doesn't phase most people, I would think. And the Izuka was responsible for helping out on Sonic 3 and Knuckles, and a much, much more games that people really seem to like as opposed to people dislike. I mean, he even had a hand in forces and allowed Mania to continue with development. And Sega are just the ones making the financial decisions. So where do I think much of this crap occurred? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with Ian Flynn's influence more than anything else. And yes, I did say Ian Flynn right there. You know, the wonderful angel that everyone loves so much in this fandom. I think he's probably had more of a negative impact in the series than anything else. So I'm going to go through all the history of where this started, and then show you why Ian Flynn irreparably damaged the Sonic franchise and its fan base. Because there is a lot to cover in this situation. Now, some of the first recorded instances I can see of Ian ever coming onto the scene was a couple of letters he wrote to Archie. Basically, he's detailing what he thinks about each issue, going into extreme details. It's literally just a complaint piece with him acting like a know-it-all, but he's also done this little comic. I'm not really certain why he did this comic. It's pretty much just Sonic and Tails go, but according to someone on Dylan Thomas's server, this was apparently written and made by Ian Flynn. He also did a Teletubby Sonic the Hedgehog crossover. No, I'm not joking. Most famously, or rather infamously, he created the fan comic known as Other M. No, not Metroid Other M, just Other M. This is a comic that is so terrible that I was screaming my fucking lungs out. And that's not an exaggeration. It might even be worse than Sonichu. And that isn't an exaggeration. Furthermore, I noticed that a lot of problems that Ian Flynn tends to have also start to appear in this comic, such as the random shock value, characters acting out of character to suit the story needs, a nonsensical plot, and, according to someone who used to work on Other M, Tyrant Rapist Knuckles. Although later became Tyrant Rapist Shadow, but that's besides the point. So what bearing on the story does this have? Absolutely nothing. There's no reason for it, it's just there for the sake of being shocking. There also happens to be a page in issue 21 where Sally gets her head blown off. There's not really any context to it, she just gets her head blown off and then Amy kisses Sonic. Yes, this actually does happen. Why is that? I have no idea, it's just there. But please keep in your head for right now because it will become important much later. And worst of all, the dialogue and storylines just drag out for far too long. Why is this? I have absolutely no idea. But... Going into Archie... It doesn't stop. Now, Ian got into Archie by writing, in his words, a bunch of unsolicited proposals. However... You're not supposed to do that. At least that's not how you're professionally supposed to do something like that. And... Every single time, these would fail. He would pester the writers, he would pester artists, and say, Hey, I, could you guys give me a job at, at Archie, please? I'm begging you, please give me a job at Archie. And each time he get turned down. He was only ever brought on because of a change in editors. And some might say Ilya Baker, but I don't know how valid that one is. Nor am I going to discuss it here. Now, interestingly enough, Ian didn't go through all these hoops to become a writer just because he was this big super fan. That wasn't really the case. According to someone who used to work with Flynn, his entire point in getting into the comic was to remove any elements from the American continuity. This became very apparent since a lot of characters that were exclusive to Archie were dying off. 
all under the influence pen. Most notably, Sally Acorn died a couple of times. Or characters returned evil, out of absolutely nowhere. Sales around this time also began to fluctuate heavily, with them dropping the moment Ian Flynn gets onto the book. In spite of wonky sales, however, the book did manage to garner a fan base big enough to keep the comic book going. Ian Flynn even began using his own forums as a means to communicate with his friends, along with DeviantArt. However, things would begin to change. Would you be able to tell us exactly what happened when you guys had to reboot the comic and why John Gray said that you needed to fight to keep the Freedom Fighters in the new continuity? Uh, I don't know how many specifics I can get into because, you know, here's something that folks don't seem to understand. I think we're going to be coming back to that with later questions is there is private talk between businesses that remains private because it's business talk with the reboot there were a lot of circumstances and my ultimate goal was to keep the feel of the old style of the stories while doing something that was more faithful to the games because ultimately that's where i was taking the book anyway right and this was just the fast forward button uh the issue with the freedom fighters is that they are from an old, defunct spin-off from the franchise. They're not really considered high-value properties, I guess, in terms of the overall franchise. Sega wants anything representing their product to be clearly representative of that product. Having stuff that diverges from that is not good. That said, they have given us an extremely large amount of creative license with this series, even post-reboot. So, After the reboot, Flynn would push the fast-forward button and jump straight to the reboot, where the universe is more like the games. Sega also supposedly put in mandates to make sure nothing like this ever happened again. These mandates include, but are not limited to, Sega characters cannot have family members. They are also not permitted to be romantically involved with anyone else. However, Amy is only allowed to like Sonic. Characters can't change outfits. Mobius is not a permitted term. Archie characters can appear anywhere else. Pender's characters and concepts cannot be mentioned. Sonic must always win. He is also not permitted to cry. And the Sega cast cannot develop unless permitted. Needless to say, fans weren't very happy about the new changes, and so the reboot failed. Combine this with an arc that lasted for over three years, interest in the comics began to wane further and further and further. There wasn't much keeping people reading by that point in time, so Archie pulled the plug. So story ideas such as the departure of the Freedom Fighters or anything else really was cancelled. However, that wasn't the end. Around this time, Sonic Boom was airing, and so Ian got to write a Sonic Boom comic adaptation. He was also given permission to write a few episodes for Sonic Boom, however, these weren't particularly liked by fans of Sonic Boom. After the reboot attempted to make the Archie comics a one-to-one -one copy of the games and failed in sales and in terms of keeping an audience, Archie refused to renew the license. Due to fan demand, however, IDW would be making more Sonic the Hedgehog comics, and at the head of all this would be Ian Flynn. Ian Flynn would be writing for the Sonic the Hedgehog comics again. Archie fans are hopeful that he would bring the Freedom Fighters into the new comic book, there was even some hopes that the Archie storyline to be wrapped up, and other fans were just glad to see that Ian Flynn was back. The hype for IDW Sonic was huge at the time. IDW was hyping it up as being the comic book that was going to save the company. 
And new people were also hoping to get into the Sonic comics as a result of this. And the first issue sold very well, selling over 21,000 copies. However, this didn't last. The comic ultimately failed to gain a new audience. Even as people like Diversity in Comics were telling people to buy it, to show the comic book industry what they wanted, it wasn't enough to really save the book, as most normies had dropped off after the first issue, because the second issue sold only 14,000 copies. The comic had ultimately failed to garner the mainstream audience. However, the Archie fans that came over were still hopeful, and the Sonic fans that were already on the book really liked it, in spite of its problems. However, as time went on, the hopes of the Archie fanbase had grown... null. They were teased consistently about the Freedom Fires returning, and at the end of the day, Flynn never delivered, only giving out very vague answers that led towards they're not going to be in this year, or, the, or next year, or the year after that, and points where he would just change the subject to something else. So the Archie fanbase slowly began to trickle out. However, they were still fans who really liked Ian Flynn's work, and continued to read because they enjoyed the book. However, Flynn began talking more and more during this point in time to his fanbase. Until eventually all this communication culminated in him insulting his customers. Because, like I said earlier, Diversity in Comics had promoted IDW Sonic, so Ian Flynn, in all of his wisdom, decided it would be a great idea to immediately insult Comicsgate, the same people that had promoted his book and supported him, many of whom supported him even in his early days on the comic, were now being thrown to the wayside. They were referred to as bigots, and this infuriated many of them. So, just like that, comic skaters had stopped reading the book. And keep in mind, they supported the comic in spite of John Gray attacking them for not supporting his radical left views. Same thing with Tracy Yardley. They put up with the book in spite of Yardley's radical left views because Ian Flynn was writing for the book, and a lot of these people really liked Ian Flynn. And Ian Flynn decided to go on ahead and insult them. Now all that's left are a bunch of hardcore Sonic fans. And at this point, hardly anybody talks about IDW Sonic. Much like Star Wars before, it was suggested this new entry would save the franchise, and it delivered none of that, to the point where there's a very small amount of viewers left. At this point, because of the drop in sales, and IDW's crippling debt, it's not a matter of if the Sonic comic gets cancelled soon, it's more so a matter of when. They put all this faith in the Ian Flynn, and he couldn't deliver. And that leads us to where we are today. Now, I'm going to talk about Ian Flynn's bias right here, because I think it affects his writing in more ways than just one, but also affects the way he acts. So I'm going to give a few examples. Now, I already mentioned how the sales would fluctuate back and forth, and how Ian began killing off characters and changing things so the comics were more like the games, such as Egg Graves becoming the special zone. Sure, other writers killed off characters, but not to this extent, and the way Ian did it really came off as being very mean-spirited. I think the worst example of this, of course, being the Mega Sally art, because you had characters turning evil, disappearing, getting crippled, dying off, the likes. And one of the series' mainstays, Antoine, was supposed to die. And that was brought to light through Lost Hedgehog Tales. Furthermore, originally it was said that Ian Flynn fought tooth and nail to keep the Freedom Fighters in the comic book. However, Ian stated that the only reason they were kept in the book is because they were grandfathered in. And that would explain why they don't really belong in the reboot, because they weren't really supposed to be in the reboot. So Flynn is obviously biased in favor of the Japanese continuity. However, the funniest part about this is that much of this bias seems to come from Amy Rose. And yes, that, it, it, that does sound ridiculous, but let me explain... Because throughout Flynn's run, he really tries to push the importance of Amy more than any other writer. Such as Amy being the first person that Tales reveal Fiona was evil to. And in the Mecha Sally arc, Amy is the driving force. 
that makes Sonic go back to fighting. Furthermore, Mecha Sally sounds cool on paper, but she becomes a complete pushover. But she's barely a threat to most people, especially Amy. And Mecha Sally tells Amy to go out with Sonic, and we get all these shipping moments between Sonic and Amy. You'd think the guy who just lost his girlfriend would be coming up with ways to get her back and be a bit more heartbroken, but... No, they just try to push Son Amy in a lot of these issues. But that will continue into the reboot where she is vital for them to find the Chaos Emeralds to save the world. And yes, I know people are going to say, well, Amy being featured in the reboot more often is because of Paul Kaminsky. I don't believe it. I haven't found any evidence of Paul Kaminsky mandates, and I have no evidence that Paul Kaminsky is obsessed with Amy Rose. I found more instances of Flynn talking positively about Amy than anything else. And he goes into such detail about how Sonic and Amy are kindred spirits and that Amy doesn't slow him down like Sally does. <laughs> In terms of the games, Son Amy is sorta canon, with the emphasis being on Amy pursuing Sonic. You could also argue Elise and Blaze were the distinction, but the games are pretty clearly Son Amy. The comics are Son Nobody, Sonic is currently into Sally, but we're bound by Sega's rules to not have him fully commit to anybody. He can move on to Amy or somebody else entirely. Reminder, he wants to make the comics more like the games, and this is the sort of bias that he shows. <laughs> The worst example of his bias, I think, is an IDW with Amy. Because in Forces, Amy is a radio operator, and she is a fighter. She's clearly a very competent fighter because she's able to hold her own in the battle. Now, here's the next part I wanted to sort of bring up. Knuckles. Knuckles was the leader of the Resistance, and he was the one who helped bring the Resistance to victory. Now, sure you can say, well, his plan to take Robotropolis back failed, but I'm going to interject by saying that Knuckles' plan would have worked, if Infinite didn't come into the picture. And plus, under his leadership, the Resistance still succeeded. So how did he go from being a competent leader to a bumbling idiot? Coercely, why is it that Amy is all of a sudden a leader? I don't remember her being second in command in forces, but IDW retcons this. Just so they can have Amy Rose become the leader later on down the line. And when Knuckles is next to Amy, I get the feeling that they just downgraded Knuckles just so Amy could become the leader. Because she's the one doing all the leading, not Knuckles. So Amy ultimately ends up becoming a Mary Sue version of Sally Acorn. But then again, the reason I say Mary Sue version of is because Sally Acorn actually had flaws. She had a character arc. She felt like an actual person. She developed. And you got to see her develop. And that's what makes Sally such a beloved character. Amy in IDW is just a leader throughout the entire comic. She has just about everything handed to her on a silver platter, and any flaws that she has are ultimately glossed over or are not her fault at all. The best example I can give would be Rey in Star Wars. Look at how she's written and look at how Amy is written in IDW. In both instances, the writer is trying to shove down your throat how great this female character is. And to show you how biased Flynn is towards Amy Rose, the Battle for Angel Island is nothing more than a copy of Panic in the Sky. In Panic in the Sky, Sally broadcasts the plan onto television, and this causes it to get intercepted, nearly destroying their chances on the battlefield, and almost killing Nicole. But in Battle for Angel Island, Amy doesn't make any of these same mistakes. In fact, the only person who causes the plan to go awry is Shadow. Before Archie was cancelled, Sonic was supposed to leave the Freedom Fighters, and there's a very likely chance they were going to be phased out entirely after that. This is why I don't think it's a coincidence Ian killed Sally two or three times. Because he's so biased in favor of Amy Rose, and it's cringy. It's really, really cringy. Because he has to ruin several characters, and he has to ruin the storyline just so Amy Rose can get the spotlight. For, as he calls it, a 15-page advertisement for the games. And I know some people are going to say, well, why would he take Sally Acorn's personality and give it to Amy if he hated Sally Acorn so much? And I would like to remind you all that Rule of Heart 94 also really hates Sally Acorn, and yet he prays the hell out of Amy Rose acting more like Sally Acorn. There's no logic to it, he just really wants it to happen. And yes, I did just compare Ian Flynn to Rule of Heart 94, we're going to see more of this as time goes on, by the way. Now, I think in terms of his obsession with Son Amy and an absolute disdain for anything American Sonic, I think the peak of that, the one that I absolutely despise the most, was when he decided it would be a good idea to make Sally Nicole gay for no other reason 
than just to make them gay. It was a plot line that made absolutely no sense in any regard of the word, especially since Nicole is supposed to remember the old world, so why is she a lesbian all of a sudden? Who knows? But Ian Flynn said initially, If I didn't think that it would seriously derail things, I would push for it harder. But I honestly think that if we were to try to go that route, the fan backlash would be detrimental to the book. I'm kind of done with it in general. So this isn't to say I don't support a Sally Nicole pairing. I'm just kind of done with pairings at all. And once the comic ended, he immediately said, Lee and I were surprised we got away with it being so blatant. And so, whenever the question was brought up or the idea was questioned, Ian would respond sometimes and give a very passive-aggressive remark saying it was going to happen either way, only to then immediately say, but I'm done with shippings. No, no, okay. no, 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 no shipping. None. I am done with it. You can set sail with any ship you want, but do not come to me and say the majority of the fan base wants, because they do not. So the answer is no, then. <laughs> no. Okay. What about Sally and Nicole? No. <laughs> I mean, you Don't even do it. you even said you wanted to explore romance with him. I'm just saying. Yeah, well, that storyline's dead now, so how do you like that? We don't have to worry about that anymore. All right, fine. <laughs> uh, the intention, we never actually got to do it, but the intention was that Sally would be bi, so that she did have interest in Sonic in the early days, and things didn't work out between them, and that she would eventually move on with Nicole. So yeah, he was aware that the fans didn't want it, but he went through it anyways, and his logic is, well, if she can't get with Sonic, then she decides to go for uh, Nicole, because that makes sense. I mean, it's the same logic that was used to explain why Iceman is all of a sudden gay, which never made sense then, it still doesn't make sense now. Though nowhere near as bad as how some of his friends acted, because the way Jen had acted was pretty bad. And the bias here isn't just because he wants Sonic to be with Amy Rose, although that does seem to play a big role in this one. The bigger one, however, is the fact that he decided to try to shove politics into the comic when it didn't belong, and in such a way that it didn't really fit. Sure, there have been politics in this comic beforehand, but they were usually woven into the storyline to make sense. And, you know, keep the story entertaining. I don't even know what point Sally being gay had in the comic other than, oh, we have a gay character now, guys. And shoving that into a comic book series with the main draw is its characters and story. And then you decide to butcher two of the characters for political reasons. That's not going to sit well with your fan base. That's not going to sit well at all. And granted, as I've already shown, this is the first time he's butchered characters for dumb reasons. But this was the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of people. But this wasn't even the biggest attack on his customers, or his largest display of social justice warrior standards. That would be the whole foray between him and Comicsgate. I mentioned that earlier in the video, but here's the longer version of what happened. You see, the artist at IDW, known as John Gray, had begun chain-blocking people over following diversity in comics. And he began attacking them, calling them Nazis, and saying that they were harassing him. And I have no idea whether or not that part is actually true. If I don't know if anyone actually harassed John Gray or not. It could very well be a form of gaslighting. But either way, we have John Gray calling anybody to the left of Lenin Nazis and homophobes and other kinds of phobes and all the other dictionary definitions that SJWs love to spew out nonsensically. And a lot, too. And so Ian Stewart comes in to defend John Gray, only to reveal how much he has a dislike for comic book shops, and ends up alienating half of his fan base, if not a good portion of his fan base. And this ultimately led to comic skaters calling Sega up on the matter. Now, the last time they called Sega, it was over the increasingly seedy business practices of IDW. But this one was bigger than the last one. The last one had 210. This one had way more than even that. So when people are calling up SEG representatives, you know there is definitely a problem. And the way he describes comic book stores shows me a man who really 
isn't all that interested in comic books, to say the least. Although I wouldn't actually consider this the first time he's actually gone after Comicsgate. I think that would have to be this little series of tweets, where Ian Flynn thanks his fans for quote-unquote correcting somebody who used a source which he called his hater, since he can't be there to correct every bit of misinformation, while using a bunch of wording to hammer in how grateful he is for them doing this, and saying that he's not trying to recruit a cheer squad, but that's obviously what he's trying to do. So who made this mysterious video? And who was the mysterious source? I don't know. He never says who it is. Or how it's spreading misinformation, so for all I know, it could actually be someone exposing something that Flynn doesn't want to get out there. Although if I had to guess who the source was, it'd probably be Hedgefox, since Hedgefox is Flynn's biggest critic. Although then again, how is the journal in question, or whatever journal we're talking about here, how in question is that false? Because... Doesn't Hedgefox usually use screenshots? I'm just saying. Furthermore, who is the video in question? Well, it's either me, or it's that Umbrella guy, and I'm more inclined to believe it was that Umbrella guy, since that Umbrella guy made an entire video where he does discuss Hedgefox's journal. But, either way, this isn't professional. He shouldn't be going after me, or that Umbrella guy, or really anybody. He shouldn't even be discussing us. Especially with how vague this is, because he's basically telling his fan base to go after people that he doesn't like. That is A, not professional, and B, a terrible way to handle your fan base. But Flynn did it anyways. This isn't even the first time he's done something like this. This has been going back to his early days in the fandom, where he would start pestering comic book writers to get him onto the comic. There is also the fact of the matter that Ian actually encouraged bad behavior on his forums from time to time. Especially towards his critics. There is this one instance of this person, Nagus, who was pretty mad to see of the comics. So he complains from time to time, and almost immediately after he says Ian doesn't care about the Freedom Fighters, people start antagonizing him. And this quickly escalates. So when he tries to give them evidence, they continue to taunt him. And then Ian joins in, and the situation gets worse. Needless to say, this user got banned pretty quickly. Now, you can say that Nagus acted out of line, yes, but you can also say that Ian and his friends also acted out of line. If anything, Ian actually encouraged the bad behavior by not trying to break up the conversation and say, Stop it. He allowed it to continue, and he allowed it to fester. I also found his end of the light comment as well. Nagas clearly knew what he was talking about, because at one point earlier, someone mentioned to Ian that they're worried about his health, and he says, well, I gotta run it this way. And this person is concerned that Ian's going to have a mental breakdown. So they are genuinely concerned for Ian's health, and Ian's response is that he is fine, and that people shouldn't use the, uh, Sonic fans line because any negative changes are considered trolling on his part. Flynn also says that BKC can get rowdy and that he has to give them a collective stink eye. But it's not a bad place to be, guys. He also says that he makes admonishing comments that are made to be broad, so doesn't feel like he's putting a sack of verbal bricks on someone's head. He also says that he has everything planned out, I'm assuming for the book. And that everyone's going to adapt to what's going on, discovering everything piece by piece, and that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And that you guys are going to get to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It, it, it never happened. Ever. But this comment, the reason why it's of interest to me is that it does show that Ian Flynn was antagonizing people on the forums. But this isn't the first time either. In fact, there's also instances of Ian Flynn talking about Penders and the whole Penders lawsuit. Because Flynn states that on Penders' own forums, Penders himself say that he didn't own the characters. Flynn also stated that Penders would take him over to court for a lot of things. He also stated some of the mandates as well. This seems to be some of the earliest mention of the mandates that I could find. In fact, a lot of information about the Penders lawsuit came from the Bumble King forums, much of which isn't even accurate to official documents. Strangely enough, even Wikipedia sources the Bumble King forums when talking about Penders. 
I also found it weird how not a whole lot of people challenged Flynn on this. In fact, one of the rules happens to be no harsh criticism. What's harsh criticism? I don't know. It could be anything. It could just be a broad term in there to keep people from saying anything that Flynn doesn't want them to say that happens to be negative about him, be it true or not. There is also this interesting set of notes made by one of Flynn's uh, moderators on a guy named Metallica in 1991. Karaji Lea writes, needs to get a grasp on the concept of opinion and then the concept of informed opinion, i.e. don't go complaining about addition of new characters like the Chaotix when Vector was created at the time of Sonic 1. If you have a complaint or dislike, cite actual reasons, and make sure your opinion is formed on some kind of valid basis. Now, opinions aren't entirely based on facts, but... I don't know. This comment sounds very, uh, Gulan-like. I wonder if they're handing out any free Kool-Aid. There is also the fact of the matter that the Bubble King Forms was nothing more than an echo chamber throughout much of its lifespan. There is a reason why you, when you go onto the forums you hardly see anyone really questioning Flynn, especially on the Sat AM site, because he would actually prevent people from joining in on the server if they were part of Sat AM fan sites. One person, of course, being Viuli, and another one who I've mentioned more times in this channel than I can really count, being Zealous Fox. Zealous Fox has mentioned to me in calls where he made an account on the Bubble King forum, so because he was part of a Sat AM fan site, he was rejected. So, in essence, the Bumble King forum was an echo chamber that allowed an incredibly toxic community to fester. And this toxicity ultimately ended up bleeding out into other places. Like DeviantArt! Which is where we get this wonderful little quote from Ian Flynn, where we have him attacking someone and saying, The Hedgehog will do what I tell him to do, and he'll like it. These are the words of a control freak, right here. But it also reminds me of someone, someone who is a very, very wonderful person. Who could that be? I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit if you feel tired. You're not the one calling the shots, you fucking prick. So shut up and do what I tell you. The last thing I wish to touch upon is Sonic Scan F, a website dedicated to Sonic the Hedgehog comic book scans, some of which were very rare. Now, when they stopped hosting the comics, they wrote a letter mentioning Ian Flynn and his crew. And strangely enough, both Archie and Sega were well aware of the website's existence. So as it turns out, according to a staff member, Flynn was the run who wrote the cease and desist, and that they were ratted out by one of Flynn's fans, who was also on the staff. This fan ratted them out to Flynn because he wanted to get on Flynn's good side. So, Flynn and his fan base are ultimately responsible for destroying very rare pieces of Sonic history, some of which remains lost even to this very day. But do you guys see what I mean? I had briefly mentioned a lot of this stuff in the Samaj Hogue video that Flynn was doing shit like this. And I say briefly because I didn't have enough time to talk about it in full in the Samaj Hogue video. But we see all this stuff right here. And we saw a lot of this stuff in Samaj Hogue and Mick Trap. We see Samaj Hogue harassing people. And that kind of behavior was perpetuated on the forums. Some of these people abuse the copyright system to bully people into submission, and we see Flynn doing the same thing. And we see a lot of the whole Ken Penders hysteria was being fed into the fanbase by Flynn, which is why a lot of Flynn's fanbase, including MigTrap397, were so obsessed with Ken Penders to the point where they wanted to kill him. So if this is a Sonic fanbase as a whole, then this is Ian Flynn's fanbase. There is a reason why I compare his fanbase to a cult. And I know not all of them are like this, but I don't think this kind of behavior should be encouraged, ever. This is harassment. This is abuse. And the fact that a professional comic book writer was encouraging this kind of stuff honestly makes me sick. Okay, so what if Ian's a bit of a jerk? As long as he's still writing good comics, we can be fine. But pesky old Sega keeps holding him back. Yeah, about that. Those mandates never actually existed. The mandates that you see on forums, they never existed. I already found it suspicious enough that the only place where I could find them, at least the earliest place that I could find them, was the Bumble King forums. And the fact that Flynn was also the one who was spreading them around. 
But, I hate to tell it to you all, but the mandates do not exist. They never existed. Now you're probably saying, well, where's the proof? And I say, here it is. Now initially I wanted to keep this one secret since he wanted to be anonymous, but at this point I can pretty much just leak these with no consequences whatsoever. So Richard Kudo tried to revive his whole Saturday and movie project, and of course some of the things that he said were very interesting, and I'll leave some of the screenshots up on the screen so you can scroll through them. But to give you a basic rundown, Sega of Japan wants everything to be game-centric. That's pretty obvious, and they are heavily focused on nostalgia, but why is that? Well, it has a lot to do with the reboot. For some bizarre reason, Sega came to the conclusion that the reboot was more successful than the pre-reboot, even though the reboot was the shortest-lived run of the comic. Because of this, they took the games into a direction of being more heavily reliant on nostalgia, much like the reboot, and of course being much more watered down. This is also why they will not use the Freedom Fighters. They see no reason to use the Freedom Fighters because they really don't like the versions of the Freedom Fighters that were featured in the reboot. They seem to like the old incarnations of the characters. It also gets weirder because in Sega's mind, the Freedom Fighters remind people of Ken Penders, and they want to distance themselves as much from Ken Penders' stuff as possible, because they think that that's what's going to piss off the fans, which doesn't make any sense when you realize people were asking for those characters back. And at some point, Richard basically ends off by saying that if the movie does good, then Sega will probably go back to doing something creative again. Because as it stands right now, Sonic is in the gutter. The franchise is at an even worse point than it's been in years. While Force has tried to do some things new, it still was bogged down by nostalgia and a lot of other problems. And it means that we'll never see anything as remotely creative as Adventure 1, 2, or anything from the 2000s or Classic Era ever again. And that's primarily because Ian Flynn has basically turned this franchise into a direction that's going to kill it. And Hedgefox would later contact Rafa Knight, and Hedgefox would later leak these conversations. Now, this does reveal a lot. Now, Hedgefox asks her a question, talking about the mandates. And she gives an example of what a Sega mandate is versus what a Flynn mandate is. And she says outright that the mandates that are found on forums are actually things that are made by Flynn. These mandates were created to make sure that things didn't go crazy without Flynn's consent. Afterwards, Hedgefox starts complaining. And while he is complaining, Rafa and I goes into detail about how, well, you might like Evan Stanley's work, or you might like the work of the people who did the spinoff, but it all goes back to Flynn. And I have no doubt in my mind that Flynn still approves the stories. Of course, Hedgefox initially doesn't believe it, but she keeps on telling him that no matter what stories you liked, Flynn had the final say. She does state that Sega has given them complete creative freedom while writing the book. She does not, however, state that Ian Flynn was given control over the book, so to me it just comes off as him basically exerting full control over the book. But on the bright side, Rafa and I does confirm that Sally Acorn is owned by Sega, and that there are no legal problems when getting her into the book. It's just that Flynn really doesn't want to, and in her eyes, they don't need to be in the book because it would be bad for new time readers. Which means the mandates that people were complaining about for years that were imposed upon Archie and IDW after the whole Ken Penders lawsuit never actually existed. They were a creation of Ian Flynn. And not only that, but it also shows that Flynn had a vice-like grip over the comics. Because everything went through him. Everyone had to follow his rules whether they liked it or not. But it also means that at some point during Archie's run, Flynn got full control over the comic and turned it into his pet project. Which means every single problem people have had with the comic since Archie has been due to Ian Flynn's influence. And to give an example of just how much power Flynn has over the comic, let's say you joined at AW as a writer, and you had this epic idea. Let's say this epic idea is where Sonic learns about his past. And throughout his journey, Eggman tries to stop him because this could potentially destroy the Eggman Empire. And so, Sonic develops as a character and learns more and more about himself and becomes a better person at the end. And you know the fanbase is going to love the story, but Ian Flynn will say, Ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, you didn't say the magic word. Uh, uh, uh. Whereas Flynn could write a storyline where, in an attempt to impress Sonic, Amy tries to assassinate the president of Gun. But, she fails, gets arrested, 
and then Sonic comes out as gay for Tails. Of course, I really don't think he would ever write a storyline like that, but I think you get the point. Ian Flynn has way too much control over the comics. If Sega will let him do whatever he wants, then he'll do it. But he doesn't want anyone else to have that same kind of creative freedom. So he enforced mandates on all the writers. But of course, he took the comics in a direction that nobody wanted. Nobody wanted the comics to be exactly like the games. Nobody wanted the comics to just retell the same stories they had already seen in the games. Nobody wanted the comics to be this boring. People wanted to see character development. And Ian didn't. So, when people complained about the reboot, he leaked his own mandates and blamed them on Sega so people would go after Sega. That's why, so far, no form of media, aside from the comics, has ever had these mandates enforced upon them. And I'd like to remind you all, this is still happening. As recently as 2019, when Flynn was getting praise for the comic, someone asked Flynn, Mr. Flynn, why is Sega keeping a tight leash on what can or can't happen to IDW Sonic? And Flynn's response is, they are not. And yet, later, the moment he turns Shadow into an idiot, just so we can have Shadow get roboticized, he says the following. What was your reaction after seeing the criticism and thoughts of the fans after Sonic IDW issue number 19? I... They're not completely wrong. Kind of amused with the discourse that came out of it, because Shadow doesn't act like that. He acts like this. No, he doesn't. He acts like this. No, he doesn't. He acts like this. In this game, he clearly acts like this. Yeah, well, in this game, he clearly acts like this. It's almost like he hasn't had a really consistent characterization since his inception. I wish we could do something closer to what we had in the old days, but that's not where they want his character to be right now, so that's not where he is. Cool. Which means whenever he says he's fighting to put the Freedom Fighters in the book, or that Sega forced him to ruin Shadow, or that the stories aren't as interesting because Sega is forcing him to water it down, it's all a lie. So Flynn could add the Freedom Fires whenever he wanted to into IDW. He could end the Zombot arc right here and now. And he could give the stories more depth, but he doesn't want to. So he had a heavy hand in killing the comics and making the fanbase the toxic cesspit it is today. And there was even a possibility he's already written for the games, starting with the Sonic Forces beta script. You know, the one that was so terrible that Sega scrapped it and had to bring in Pontaf to fix it? Yeah, that beta script. I mean, it's certainly written like how Ian Flynn would write a script. And, according to Ian Flynn's portfolio, it says he wrote for Sonic Forces, not the prequel comics. We're talking Forces specifically. And even if he didn't write for Forces, even if he didn't write that awful beta script, he still shouldn't be writing for the games. He keeps blaming Sega and using his fanbase to shut up his critics. He hasn't improved. In fact, a lot of the problems people have with the games so far, such as... Over-reliance on memes, flanderizing characters, heavy use of nostalgia to appeal to older fans, and not doing anything interesting with the plot, well, all that stuff is found in Ian Flynn's books. Especially in IDW. In fact, if anything, IDW cramps that crap up to 11. But of course, someone had to leak these band-aids before this video came out. Now, in spite of the fact that these have absolutely nothing to do with what Raffle was talking about, or what Aaron Rebel was talking about, it also supposedly exposes that Rafa Knight was lying about the mandates, and that Flynn was right the entire time. And of course, you have Ian Flynn here to back it up. So it must be true then. So I guess I've lost, except for the fact that this creates a catch-22. Now let's ignore the evidence we have so far, ignore the fact that Rafa leaked these mandates to the Hedge Fox, in hopes of him liking Ian Flynn, and why they were originally taken down to begin with. Let's ignore all of this for a few minutes. If Ian Flynn is telling the truth about Rafa, then what that means is, is that he leaked a bunch of mandates that were not supposed to be made public, which in turn ruined Sega's reputation and caused Sega lots of customers. And if Rafa Knight is to be believed and Ian Flynn is lying about the mandates, then that means that he created a bunch of fake mandates to strangle the comic creatively, which drove away customers and ruined Sega's reputation by blaming it on them. And that made them look incompetent. So either way, Flynn is a complete liability to Sega. They have no reason to keep him around. So all of those Flynn for Sonic shills that came from the forums and beyond, who parrot Flynn's narrative, shit on Archie for being written like a comic book and not a game, 
and then praise IDW as if it's the second coming of Christ, and that it's the direction that modern comic books should be going in, while making all these shitty Ken Pender jokes that stopped being funny back in 2013. And considering how little integrity a lot of these people actually have, and the fact that a lot of them don't even read comic books, why are we listening to these posers? They keep calling us immature for criticizing IDW and trying to shame us into submission so they can push Flynn for Sonic and talk about how awesome IDW is. We're not allowed to talk, but they are. And that, in part, is what's causing Sega to go in the direction it's going down now. And that's only going to continue hurting the franchise. And the sales reflect that. 21,000 to 9,000. How do you fuck it up that badly? And what's even worse is that Flynn's perfectly capable of writing a good comic, but he just doesn't want to! And so they are desperate to try to keep him on the book. And the longer he stays on the book, the more damage he does to the franchise, and the more likely he is to write for the games. And all I have to see on that is, look at what happened to Archie. Look at what's happening to IDW. That's what's going to happen if Ian Flynn gets to write for the games. And that becomes a very likely possibility the longer he stays with this franchise. And they become desperate to keep him on the book and get him into the games. And yet, by defending him in this way, they've actually cornered him. They've actually proven that he is nothing more than a liability. And considering how many people have actually proven that those mandates are fake, including Aaron Weber... ...answer this one indirectly, but I wanted to know if Sega put down a list of hard restrictions on what Sonic stuff you can or cannot use, like, at the beginning. Like, say a writer wanted to adapt Sonic Labyrinth, and, like, <laughs> Sega would step in and say, no, you can't do that, or a writer wanted to, say, put Madonna in the comic. Or Luigi. And, uh, uh, yeah, like... Uh, so, so Sega might not step in and say you can't use Sonic Labyrinth, but uh, even if they didn't, I would. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we didn't put any kind of hard and fast rules saying you can't do this, you can't do that. Uh, we approach things on a case-by-case -case basis, and whatever really makes sense for the character and the brand, and just telling the story, um, you know, of Sonic in general, making sure that we're doing it properly um, without jumping the shark. Flynn can no longer keep using Sega as a scapegoat, even for things that happened in the Mega Man comic, which, yes, actually happened. And we cannot keep getting silenced, or else this franchise will die. So I think it's about time that we as fans put a wrench in that hole and actually start speaking up. Because I'm hoping that with this video, more people will talk out against IDW publicly, and more people will actually call out the kind of abuse that's been caused by Flynn's fanbase. And at some point, I'm hoping that somebody, anybody at Sega, will hear this and do something about this, because this has gone on for long enough, and it needs to stop. And if IDW does get cancelled, then it's not like it's the end of the world for Sonic the Hedgehog comics. There are certainly other publishers. I mean, Udon has none of the problems that IDW has, and the people there seem to be fans of Sonic in general and not just the games, or at least a very biased, twisted version of the games, like at IDW. And they did try to seek the license before IDW did, although granted IDW got it first. So if IAW is cancelled, then we should push for Udon. I think it'd be better for the franchise in the long run, too. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you haven't already, subscribe. And if you liked, then give it a like. And if you'd like, comment. I always love to read you guys' comments.